Um, and we kick off. So you're all really welcome uh, to this evening's Wednesday webinar. Um, a great topic and a great speaker lined up for you all this evening. Um, my name obviously is Anya. I uh, manage Burnview Trust, many of you know me, um, and, and lovely to be here with you this evening for this great um, topic. Um, I've nothing much to, to say by way of introduction. I'm sure many of you, if you're here, know of Michael and his amazing work on uh, folklore.ie and great, um, really engaging posts on Facebook. So if you don't follow him already, I'm, I'm, we often don't... Um, you know, hard to see the good sometimes in social media, but absolutely Michael is the man if you're trying to see the benefit of sharing messages um, around these kind of topics, uh, well worth a follow. But without uh, going on too much, I'm going to hand you over to Michael, the usual format. Uh, Mike will chat to us for 45 minutes or so. And then if you've got things that are coming up as we're going along, please pop them into the chat or the Q&A and we'll get as many of the questions to Michael at the end of the session. So thanks, Michael, and over to you. Brilliant. So thanks a million, Anya, and uh, thanks to, to all of you who have joined to, to watch this. Listen, the lads here have asked me to do a talk around Easter, so I'm going to start off and chat loosely with you around Easter and um, the, the lead up to it, some traditions from Ireland, and then some of the follow on the end tail traditions as well associated with Easter, say so 40 days before and 40 days after, and looking at that and looking at it from a kind of very kind of an Irish perspective, but also looking at it from just a, a wider links that we might we might know that exist uh, right across Europe. Um, so what I'm going to do is I've prepared some photographs for you um, and just going to bring in a bit of an outdoor, a bit of a walk uh, through the fields, as I say, and I'm going to share a screen across with you right now, and I'm going to share my desktop with you. And uh, just very quickly before, what I do is I spent the last 25, 20 years now, probably 25 recording um, folklore and collecting stories and recording and sharing them back to uh, places where I get them from and open up conversations and all that kind of jazz, right? But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, that's the kind of a process there. So what I'll do is when I'm talking, I'll just be referencing people or stories who I might tell you. So that was my rock and roll lifestyle for years, literally recording, collecting and sharing back in village halls and producing content. And in the last maybe seven years, sharing a lot of the content online um, in, a, in a space that, uh, that, that, that I can control and, and make work for me and also and for other people can engage with but listen this we're here to talk about easter as my grandmother home on the east, east coast of Wexford would call it it was never easter and maybe it was, this is an old pre vow shift uh, pronunciation for it but it's very close to the old english uh, and the kind of the the the, um, the, the dutch and german germanic backgrounds that where we get the name easter from and um, but uh, you'd still hear people and i'm sure if you listen around county clare as well you might hear people say Easter. My grandmother used to always say when they went Googling for eggs as children back in the early 1920s, they'd always say, Me Easter egg on you. Um, for, when we're looking for eggs for, 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 for Googling, which I'll tell you about later on. But that's Easter or Easter for you, right? But it's just, just Easter, an old pronunciation. But before I even start, though, I'm going to go back to the holly and Christmas. And one of the things, whatever, that my own mother did, and neighbours, some neighbours did it, Warden didn't do it. And it wasn't as common as. as, as um, it wasn't that common, but the idea was you'd always keep the Christmas holly up after the 6th of January and you'd keep it up and you'd use it to light your, the fires on Pancake Tuesday. And on Pancake Tuesday, we all know, know was the kind of the, that was the herald of the start of Lent. And then you'd basically use up all your eggs and all your, you weren't, weren't supposed to have any eggs or meat or uh, during the course of Lent. And the idea was that you'd have a big uh, feast or a, 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 a big feast on, on that day. And that tradition of Pancake Tuesday, Shrove Tuesday, was found right around Europe. Now, a few interesting things was, uh, we've hence, by the way, a few interesting things was we, um, it was also signaled the start of Carnival and uh, through a lot of European countries. Um, the French do it, the Dutch do it, um, um, they do it in parts of Belgium, they do it right down the Basque country in Spain. And one of the things was a start of the herald of the, it, 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 it the start of spring. And I was literally down in, only in the Basque country there a couple of a couple of weeks ago, and they bring this kind of a figure, and it's almost like a winter. Some say it's a bandit, more people say it was a winter witch figure. This is a male figure, and it's very similar to a figure that you would get in Poland and, and you get into Ukraine and you get down in Hungary as well. This idea of this figure that would represent winter, and winter then would come spring and you'd bring this fella on a bit of a tour and some people would have young lads in costumes dressed up as witch, with witches kind of hats and brushes and they'd be sweeping winter away and welcoming in spring and that's what it was the idea of welcoming in spring and you, it's great the whole the whole in, in particularly on the northern spain and the mass country the place comes come, becomes alive just gorgeous celebrations color light the idea that spring has started now there's a lot of similarities as well they burn things like a sardine they'll do other they'll do other other kind of other kind of rituals but the idea of of, of, of going going into just being blowout before you go into lent 
And to be fair, I think our St. Patrick's Day is a kind of linked to that, even though it's an interesting one because St. Patrick's Day was the only day within Lent that you actually could have a blowout. You could go back eating fun size crunchies if you wanted to, or you could go on, on the beer, whatever you wanted to do, you could do all, all of those things. And I think with, with the layers of Christianity and the layers of different beliefs over 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 time, I think our St. Patrick's Day fits that bracket very, 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 very uh, uh, closely. Um, but obviously it's the feast day of St. Patrick now, but I think it's very, very similar to the carnival in, 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 in ways, right? An interesting one to sh show you as well is that, as I said to you, in Poland, these are images from Poland and down in, U in Ukraine and down in Hungary as well. And, and again, I know people who are living here here in Wexford would tell me this, that they would burn a thing called the Winter Witch. And this Winter Witch would be brought, she'd be burnt or she would be drowned. And it's an interesting one, those who are interested in folk costumes and traditions. If you look carefully here, look at the little girl's hat. The little straw hat, identical to our straw by hats. Funny in Wexford and Carlo, we in North Wexford, Wexford and Carlo, we call them colleagues. And colleague was the Irish word for a witch. So colleague was a was a little. There's a reference there, but we need to untangle it a little bit more. But that idea of bringing bringing a figure along and heralding the, the start of spring was there. Now, one thing to point out to you was because Easter is tied in with this. They, their start of spring. A lot of the a lot of European countries start of spring. Like our start of spring would be tied in with St. Bridget's Day. And uh, well, a lot of these would be tied in with the, with the spring equinox, give or take the 21st, 22nd, 23rd of March. And that's a date actually that's really important with the, with the origins of Easter. So this idea of this idea of uh, winter ending and spring starting, there's there's loads of un undercurrents or little under layer, layers there. Certainly a seed in Poland and a lot of the Eastern European countries. But just to point out as well, if you look at there, they're burning the little the, the effigy of the witch in winter. If you look at our breed oaks here, here's an image from Homer Sykes from uh, down in from Kerry. And if you look at this idea, for those of you who know anything about the breed oaks, and I know in County Clare you have you have you're lucky to have Daris Daris Balan there doing great work in Innistimon. Um, and was that you would have the um a little breed oak, a little figure, a little hero St. Bridget dressed in white, give us some money to honor the night. And for those of you who don't know it, the 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 the, the breed or the, the biddy boys would go out, they still do it in in, in, part, in Kerry, they still do it in parts of the country, but Kerry kept it going strong. But it was done over here as well in Leash and Kenny and, 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 and Kildare in particular. And he would bring out this bit of effigy of a little doll. And if you look at Dario's image here, here, it's very, very similar to this kind of little figures of the the, the of the, the the winter witch, this kind of similarity of things. They were, they were, they were made they were made in similar ways as well. A neighbor of mine here who was originally from Poland was telling me they made them the same way as we're making them over in in in, in there and over on the islands over on, on one of the Iron Islands where they were made as well you know with little handbags and little ribbons and made by the girls of a certain age so there's loads of crossover within our traditions that some people don't realise that are there and that was one of the really interesting things about th this kind of work practice now and actually when I'm there as well just to show you this is not down in the, the, the dingle or it's not you know at, at a wedding in Sligo this is holy straw boys uh, at Easter, actually, this is Easter, the pure devilment. But just to show you the, the head, see the head the crowns, identical, identical. And we won't even have time to go into this now. But just to open up that conversation, because sometimes people think of traditions in Ireland. And sadly, we think that God created the Irish. And we, you know, we created these spaces, but we forget sometimes that these traditions are layers that have come in from different parts of the, different parts of Europe with different peoples over the la over centuries. Now, um, here was one thing, an interesting one thing for you, right? I mentioned to you that um, the 21st, 20, 22nd, 23rd of March was the idea that the um, was the was the, the start of spring. Uh, sorry, yeah, it's the start of spring for a lot of Eastern European countries. But one of the interesting things was you probably know yourselves was the 21st, give or take, was 21st of March was the spring equinox and an equal amount of light and equal amount of dark, give or take 20, 21st of, of, uh, of March. And here's one thing that you, you, you might know about and you might not know about, but the, all, the way Easter Sunday was, was picked, even though we say it's a Christian feast day, we're still looking up to the moon for, 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 for ideas. Uh, the way the reason was, uh, how Easter Sunday come, came about and the, the picking of Easter as a date was that you, when the spring equinox is on the 21st, then the next full moon after that, whenever that would fall, the Sunday after that would always be Easter Sunday. And once you had that Easter Sunday date fixed, based on the on the equinox and the full moon, then you can work your 40 days back to this Pancake Tuesday and 40 days onto the other side to uh, the Ascension, Ascension Thursday. So those dates hung around that and they hung around the solstice, they hung around the solstice and the full moon. 
right? Even an interesting thing to watch as well is we forget as well that until about 1752, 53, um, and it was later again in Ireland, uh, that the new year started in March. Uh, sorry, the new year started on the 25th of March. And it's hard for us to get our head around that. And that was a shift in the calendars. And when the calendar shifted from Julian to Gregorian into the calendars, the 25th of March was seen as the first month. And even as an interesting thing to watch our numbers over our years, so you go, uh, say, if March was the first month, so it'd be March, April, May, June, July, August, September, September, and even to the Irish for Sept, is it shocked in that Octo October is Oct, and it's based on Latin for the counting of uh, seven, eight, nine, and ten for the, the, the those names of those months, and you can see that within our even our months, and also our our, our numbers in, in Irish that are based 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 on that and on, on that calendar shift. And also an interesting thing as well, whatever you might know it as well, but our Halloween traditions, uh, because we lost 11 days, 11 days shifted in September. We just literally 11 days disappeared. Sorry, 13 days disappeared. Uh, I think it was 13 off the top. No, it was 11. 11 days disappeared. And uh, we look at our Halloween traditions and we look at our St. Martin's Eve traditions in Europe and they're almost identical in ways, but over time they just separate it. And there's, they're, you know, you, you look at them now, you think they're not related, but they were. But listen, come here to me, back to, back to, Back to Easter. I hope that makes sense with you, right? Uh, today actually is a day. So Easter is decided on, Easter Sunday is decided on the equinox and decided on the full moon the next week of Easter Sunday. And we're leading up now into the Christian story of Easter, of Easter Sunday. We all know those probably much earlier layers there. Sometimes we don't know what those layers are. Sometimes people are always trying to understand them and trying to, I find, I I, I, have, I just accept the layers that are there. I mightn't follow them, but I accept that the layers that are there that make it um, I don't accept the layers of one particular belief system. I accept that we're older ones there, but I sometimes I, the evidence isn't there to, to to tell you what exactly people did or what they didn't do. We can only guess right, in some ways, right? And there's some th some things that we do now are just imports. They're only imports in, in the last two, three hundred years, four hundred years. So you know, um, sometimes or even in the last fifty years, in some cases, uh, like the bowed Easter bunny. Um, but today is uh, Spy Wednesday, and uh, with the Christian story, the idea was this was was. The, Jude, you just did a dirty job on, on, on Jesus, right? But the story, there's, there's loads of folklore around it. There's one is that you never look in a mirror. Uh, some people said you've never let a child outside. Uh, it was also one of those one of those days called a Black Fast Day. And it was one of the one of the one of those num set number of days during the year where you wouldn't eat meat. And the poor old creators that uh, uh had to follow this. Um here's one account from uh, 1906 that says that the use of eggs is allowed every day in Lent, except Ash Wednesday, Spy Wednesday, and Good Friday. So Spy Wednesday is today of which there is abstinence from all white meats, uh, right? I was reading some accounts as well that in uh, up in um, County Monaghan, uh, they, was, they used to make a kind of a ball, like a, a like a ball with the shape of your hand out of porridge oats and nettles, and you would kind of you'd boil that in water and be sometimes be barely flavoured water with a bit of turnip or a bit of cabbage or a bit of an onion, but certainly no meat, right? And you would make it a drink called Suli. And it's funny, Suli or Sulok or Sulon, there's different names for it. You get it all over the country for a stew, or sorry, for a stew. And some people said it came about because there was very little meat in it. And when the meat fat would rise up to the top, you had little souls, like little eyes looking up at you. That was only a bit of fat you'd get in it. But I don't think that's the case. I think some, it comes from the word Sulok, but it, 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 it's there. And I've even come across an account of it in Newfoundland. But just when you're there as well, you always say as well, the, the nettles are actually out there, a bit young still, but at home here in Wexford and in probably other counties as well, they always say the tree feeds the nettles in the month of May. It was good for the blood. It was good for the iron. So there was, all, there was, there was probably something there as well. But the day was, was, a, was what they call a black fast day. It was no, 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 uh, no meat. You were allowed to eat fish. We grew up by the sea, so we'd have, we'd have herons um, and you'd fry them up. Um, and by the looks of them now, they'd make me hungry anyway. I don't know what about you over in Clare, but the, the, the sight of herons are, are a great, a great thing. The next thing, about whatever I'm going to talk to you about is, is uh, tomorrow as well, it was a Monday, or, no, the day there I talk about here now is a date called Clip and Friday. Now, Good Friday is Good Friday, and there's loads of bits of folklore around that. But Clip and Friday is a great one. And if you know anyone from the traveling community, ask them about this, and especially the women, because the belief that the belief is that on Clip and Friday, that you would get your hair cut, and it would usually be cut a little small bit of a cut or trimmed by a man, usually by a man, and it would grow. Here's a little page from a book that I brought out with a group of traveler women here in Wexford last year, and it's just a direct translation of what the women were telling me. You'd always trim your hair on Good Friday. Only a person with good hair would do it. 
and never let anyone with bad hair do it, right? And the luckiest time of the the luckiest time to get your hair cut is the last Friday of the month. But that is still very, very strong with the traveling community. I know over in Wales that clip on Thursday. You now, for some reason we we lost the day when it came to Ireland. I don't know how, you know, and I did arguments. And I even I came across people who are Irish travellers over in Wales, and they said, Oh no, we do Thursday and then we do Friday. So there's nothing fixed in folklore, you know that kind of way. Some people always want to spend things down, but they're not they're not fixed sometimes. Here's another one to talk about Good Friday. They also said as well, at home here, we always try to get the spuds in by 17 of March, St. Patrick's Day. And it depends on where you are in the country. But I was working with people who group up in County Down recently, and they were telling me that they would always have a bracket because the weather might be a little bit colder up there as well. And their bracket was between St. Patrick's Day and Good Friday. And that was your date then to get your stuff done. Now, you should always remember as well that these were days that people had a bit of time off as well. And had a bit of time off on St. Patrick's Day, had a bit of time off on Good Friday. But these were the dates you'd probably get those, bit, those jobs done. Um, I the, the the general belief I've come across around the country was you'd always plant something on Good Friday. If you planted anything on Good Friday, people said would said it would grow. Um, and uh, I'd still do it. I was planting trees. This was taken a couple of years ago. Um, with the help of me, me, me pet lamb, which I'll talk about in a second, right? Um, she's not a pet lamb anymore. But I'd still like the idea of planting something on a Friday. Now, some people have told me all the same. You, you wouldn't dig on a Friday. They said you wouldn't put iron into the ground or the soil on a Friday. It was bad luck. It was fierce bad luck. But again. By and large, I found those, they said people said it was good luck. I have loads of videos to show you accounts of these, of these but I, I won't have time to show you in, in, in this particular presentation. So you're going to have to take my word from it, right? But if you do want to see some of the information on this, go to the likes of my page on YouTube, and there's about a thousand videos there of recordings, and it's only a fraction of recordings over the last 25 years. So you'll hear those stories directly from the people themselves. But speaking of lambs, actually, I was looking at, at the, the, the Jewish tradition of Passover and the idea of this, I, they, they had that um, they were Jew, the, the Jews were saved by, the, I think it was the, the sacrifice, the lamb, and they put the cross over the door of, with the blood of the lamb, um, which is an interesting one because on St. Martin's Eve here, um, I've come across it in my own particular is that uh, people would get the, the blood of a fowl. Martin's Eve, by the way, is the 11th of uh, November. You'd always kill a fowl or sometimes a beast. And some people remembered getting the blood put on their forehead. More people ha had the blood put on their corners of their houses. Um, so it's very similar to that kind of tradition. But the idea of the the the, 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 the putting the cross on on it is crops up on Good Friday. And a woman called Breedy Cavanagh told me this up in North Wexford a couple of, ah, maybe 2015, 16. She said that, and this is a common story around the country. Again, with older people, sometimes we say these are common, but People are not don't come forward with a lot, a lot of these stuff. You'll have to kind of ask them and they go, oh, yes, yeah, we did that. My mother did that. So, you know, it's not it's not out there. You know, it's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not as obvious out there, right? But sometimes when you go looking and finding someone telling you something, there's absolute pure magic in it. Um, and one of the lovely things about this is they said that any egg laid on Good Friday was a, you'd keep it up till Easter Sunday, right? So you wouldn't eat it. You'd keep it up till Easter Sunday. And this woman told me, she said, the first thing you do on Easter Sunday after you boil your egg was you'd get a bit of soot and you'd mark a little cross on it, she says, and then you'd sit down. And if you had blessed salt, she said, you'd get a bit of blessed salt and you'd put a bit of blessed salt on it as well. And I explained to you about blessed salt. So you put a little sign of the cross on your eggs just on Easter Sunday morning, right? Now, one thing as well was when you were talking about egg, eggs and crosses is if any has kept hens, and we've always had hens as children, we have them now with our own children, is that when your hen would be setting, you'd always put a cross on it. And you put on a cross on it, some people said to bless the eggs. Um, and also some people said you wouldn't eat eggs over Easter because, sorry, in, in over Lent was because you were wanting to, your hens to bring out chickens. That's what you were wanting to do because spring was starting. And then you'd have your chickens then and you'd have whatever it could be. But uh, hens or cocks, whatever, and but at least you'd have, some, you'd have something then for the, for, the, for the rest of the year and for the following year. But you'd put a sign of the cross on them. One of the reasons was a very practical reason because you'd know then if a hen was setting on seven eggs and another hen laid an egg beside her, you'd know which egg was laid fresh and you wouldn't want to be cracking open a half, half fertilized or half uh, sat on egg. So you'd put an, an X on them and uh, there's our hens at home from the children. Um, and there's one with a little cross on it. So it's lovely. And I came across that tradition around the country and over in Newfoundland as well, again, where a lot of people from the southeast of Ireland went over. The identical tradition of people putting crosses on their eggs for, for luck. They believed it for luck, but also for very practical reason as well. And here, when I have you here, is a lovely word. I came across it in Clare, but I came across it in Mayo as well. Is a glugger. It's a great little Irish word for, and I, if you're basically, if your hen is setting and you're, you, you'd, um, you will uh, be no there'd be no chicken in the egg it was known as a glugger a glugger uh and a rattle you uh, this related to the word rattle but a glugger would be an empty and an egg that an egg that the chicken didn't farm in it's a little word but back to the blessed salt field here's one thing as well and again 
you'll be surprised. I find it's very strong. Kenny, Harlow, Wexford. I'd say it was in other counties as well if I went looking, but I haven't been looking. Um, but the idea was you'd always get your salt blessed at Easter and you get your salt blessed on that Saturday, Holy Saturday, the Saturday before Easter Sunday, and then you'd have your blessed salt. Now, the blessed salt was also used as well, folks. It was used for your egg that Easter Sunday morning, but it was also used for uh, if a cow would calf, people would get a piece of blessed salt and go outside and sprinkle it on the calf and the cow would lick the calf and then there was a bond. People would put it around their houses. People used the salt for, for, for protection as well as just for um for um for for for, for, for as well as during the course of the year, uh, uh rather than rather than just always on the Easter Sunday as well. But one thing whatever which I would uh if you which is worth doing and you've probably seen it yourself as well, you'd also get sorry I forgot to say you'd also get a uh, bless uh water you get water blessed Easter water you, you probably know that yourselves you'd also get potatoes blessed if you're getting your seed potatoes in or you'd also get butter blessed um and they were done I know at home my home village spuds would have been blessed um, and there would have been salt blessed and water blessed. And it's an interesting one. Over the 20 years, 25 years recording stuff, I noticed so much stuff that we did took a nosedive back in the late 60s, early 70s with regard to folk practices and folk traditions. They took that very, they became very non-public to be they retreated to be very, very private. And it's an interesting, it was in the opposite way with traditional music and dance and stuff like that, that it became, it's become something else almost now. It's, you know, it's got layers and layers of different things, performances and loads of other things going on with, 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 with the tradition music. But the folk practices were very, very different. Um, but I, I personally, I love the kind of more private folk practices um, because they're harder to find and they're, they're nice to nice when you do find them. But here's a very public one, which which has been a brilliant uh, uh God send if that's the right word to be using uh, from the Polish community that came to Ireland and also the Czechs and some of the Slovaks as well and the, the Ukrainians now in particular as well is that we have a tradition around Easter baskets and uh, I'm going to make an attempt at it is Svin, Svin uh, Sanka is S-I-E-C-O-N-K-A and if you google that right and uh, my Polish neighbour will be disgusted of my pronunciation of that. But basically, over the years, I noticed, in maybe the last 15, 20 years, I noticed this tradition of getting bring people, the Polish community, getting dressed up on, on the Saturday before uh, Easter Sunday and bringing their baskets to the whatever the local church would be. It's going on wholesale. But it was identical to our tradition of getting their salt and water and things blessed. Very, very Christian, but there's simple, there's there's other layers going back there now as well, that's to be fair, but that rather than just, just a pure, the pure Catholic story as well. So you'd have different things in it. You'd have bread, you'd have eggs, you'd have ham. It's just a gorgeous sight. And you go to any of the Polish shops now in, around the country, and you'll see all these things laid out, the little butter lambs. Some will dye their own eggs, some will buy them. You'll see the salt here beside that. You'll see little bread, you'll see bits of ham, you see sausage. Uh, you'll see a little lamb, there's usually a little butter lamb there as well, related to that lamb, the Pascal lamb. You'll see just butter here, another little jar. Horseradish here as well, just horseradish here as well for, for some of the sausage and meat. And it's just lovely to see. It's a lovely, lovely thing to see, right? But sometimes it, that's a gorgeous visual. So that was taken in Carlo. In the cathedral in Carlo, maybe five, six years ago. Um, yeah, 2018. And then here's an image taken in Carlo. Sorry, I'm going on to this man called John O'Neill. And uh, I was dresser, I was photographing his dresser a couple of years ago, two years ago. And I only when I came home, I realized, Jesus, when you look here on top of his dresser over here, the sax of salt and unwritten in it with sellotape across it is blessed salt, right? So the blessed salt is there in our, in our own little private kind of a way. We have these little things hanging around the houses, like the bottles of holy water and the old you know the, the the mineral bottles and the big brother bottles and the, the national national mineral bottles that kind of crack so there's that another tradition for you in in, in this part of the country in wexford and it wasn't done in other parts of the country again i it's simply because of the layers of coming in from 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 europe i'm um, coming in from wales cornwall england and coming in and different from you know is one particular tradition is what we have is called guggen and guggen at easter and Guggen at Easter was in one pocket of Wexford and it survived. My own grandmother did it and she, her accounts are from the 19, early 1920s. Neighbours did it, some of them did it. It was mostly the poorer families. Now in Wexford we have, you'd have strong farmers, middle farmers, poor farmers, then you would have farm labourers. And the farm labourers were owning maybe an acre, had a small bits of land and they basically survived. The last of the peasants, if you want to call it that word, a word I don't like using, but that was our background. That's where we came from. And uh, But they all, we always did it, Granny always did it. It was a chance to get a few eggs. Some people ate them, obviously naturally ate them. It was a chance to get a bit of food, but it was also a chance as well for people that sell them. And that was one of the reasons why I said it was at, 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 uh, 
died out was because young lads were getting them and then they were selling the eggs on in town later on, getting a few pence and going to the shop and buying chocolate, which is kind of natural and obvious, really, what young lads would, would naturally do. But the idea of getting dressed up, and I'll play a little clip in a minute, I have a few seconds of granny talking about it, right? But basically, you would get dressed up. These are my three girls here. And you get dressed up that Saturday, and you would go down. And just, and we brought them into Mara and Dahi, whatever. But here they are with their granddad, Alien's father. And you would literally call to your neighbours. And you'd have your little stick, a little apron, a little headdress, a little scarf. And sometimes the bigger lads went out at night time. But mostly during the day, the girls went out with a stick. And you'd also have a little stick. And the little verses you would have, uh, gug, gugs, uh, uh, gugs, gugs, eggs or money, ma'am, was one. Granny used to say, me ace the egg on you was another one. And you'd be literally begging for it, begging. The exact same as Halloween, the exact same way as the Rand boys, the exact same way as the Biddy boys. You were always looking for something. And you had a little song or a verse or whatever to play with that, right? Now... I'll let you listen to Wexford ones in a second. Look at this, lads. There's Wexford. There's Finland. I could show you identical photographs in Sweden. They do the they go out the same thing. The little witch, little Easter witch to go out the same thing, a little stick, the little branches, the little eggs hanging out of it. Identical. There's again, there's Wexford. Um sorry, there's Wexford and there's 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 Finland. And you go if you look at the Finnish tradition or the Swedish tradition. I almost identical, this idea of dressing up, calling out, right? I'm going to let you listen to just a few people's voices in that conversation, just to let you have it, uh, let you listen to them. Don't mind me minus now windows here. And I've got a few videos lined up here to show you, right? So I'm going to go and let you listen to these women here from Castle Bridge in County Wexford from 2005, a recording. Just enough to let them, let them tell you what they did. You dress up in all women, anything, all women's stores, maybe the, the boys would dress up in the women's stores and the girls would dress up in their men's stores, men's hat, men's pants and all on, and off the go. And a stick in your hand. Basket. And a basket on your arm or in a bag or something to put your, your money or whatever you get in it. You wouldn't have a whole lot in those times. But you'd go to all the houses then and you'd, when you go to the door, you'd say, books, eggs on money, man. <laughs> Yeah, the stick in the group. Yeah, and they tap the door, and maybe some of them wouldn't answer you, and some of them maybe right good. They come out and you know what to get. They're doing that still, you know. There's one part of Wexford like, that survived. I don't know how it survived in that part. Now, it was done in other parts, but they didn't dress up. They did all over Wexford, but they, did, they dressed up in our in our part. Um, here was my grandmother. Now, it's a tiny little clip, lads, if you can find it. Where has she gone to? No, I'm not going to play. I was just there. Literally, just, this was from a very old recording. But just to hear it, remember that was lovely. Um, it's the Saturday. You started learning. You remember last minute when you go to the house for your age for the age. That's all. That's all I'm going to play to you because the rest of it's not great. But a little can or a basket on Easter Sunday going around for your Easter eggs, she said. And that was from her account. She would have been from, she was born in 1912. Uh, you're talking 1920, 22, right? Early age, early youth, right? So it's an interesting one. But I'm going to show you what it looks like, a visual of what it looks like now, right? Now here's a little recording for those of you who don't know. It's just a, literally our little ones. Now, I know a few other families are doing it now as well, right? You have to make an effort for these things. Any of know with these things. Yokes just took and as I said, they took a nose dive and didn't, and, and for loads of reasons. And I'm going to show you a recent effect of COVID on this tradition as well, right? So this this is what it looks like. <laughs> I'm going to stop it, but I was going to skim through it. So the girls called to their neighbours, delighted, getting a few sweets, getting chocolate eggs. And that's repeated with some other families as well. Now, the gas thing is our little ones now just expect it every year that they're going to Google because you, we've been reintroduced back to them again. They're going Google the same way as was it their own, that their own grandmother did it, right? And going into people's houses like at Halloween and neighbours will expect to see, to see them, like in the, going out hunting around on St. Stephen's Day. Now, I was going to show you something which is kind of, I only looked on at me last night. I was sitting down getting these slides and all ready. And just to show you, this was 2001, COVID. And this will tell you about how 
traditions can get affected by obviously how life can get completely knocked on its head. All they could do then was they were dying to go out and do something. And all they could do was they got their little hen eggs from their, their hens at home, got dressed up to the pet lamb, got dressed up and called to the neighbours with their little pet lamb. So I think any, anything to get the young lads outside in the yard, or outside in the, nature is a lovely thing. Brought the lamb along the road and called to the neighbours and left them a hen egg or a duck egg, right? Couldn't even get in gates, and, right? No, that, that fact, right? And the sad thing was they called out to their own granny and grandfather, right? And just literally having to, um, I'll show you now, just stand outside their, their parent, their grandparents' gate, and or sorry, stand at the window and look in at them with a pet lamb to tell them about the, about the pet lamb, and then then to leave the eggs for them. And that went on for two years. And it's funny that, that traditions like that are, are if things like that can really just knock knock a yoke on its head. But luckily, they're going out this year again, and I know another few people are going out as well with them. But if you want to find out more about that, there's a good piece on the RT website about plan an Easter egg hunt, go Google instead, right? But here's something you will find around the country. You'll find it in Mayo, you'll find it, I'd say you can find it in County Clare as well, you'll find it in Cavan. You'll get different names for little picnics people would have. And this was uh, the, the idea that you would go out on the Saturday before Easter, or maybe that followed Monday. And they went by different names, Prat Hogs, play, play Dogs, Pro Hogs and Clue Dogs, and again different names. But I found the Clue Dog name was very strong in County Cavan. And the idea was that people would get, these are sent to me by a man I know called Niall Madden for Barn, Barn, Reardon, Cavan. And he still he still does it. And he grew up doing it. And he said he'd always go out. And I came across this, you'll get this around the country. You get living memory accounts of people doing this and still doing it. For Manna, um, Derry, uh, Donegal, still strong as well. But people would go out on the Saturday or maybe the Monday, uh, not necessarily fixed, and they would light a fire outside. And there's something magic about it, lads. Outside, a big pile of eggs. And you'd sit down and you'd eat them, right? And you'd throw whatever you'd have in to dye them. Like, and this wasn't fancy pants stuff. Now, this is a few petals off the forest bushes or a bit of grass or whatever you get your hands on. And then you would have this your clue dog outside in this spot. And it was a great chance. There was a bit of whiskey for the men and then the eggs for the children. And this is Niall himself from back in the, probably back in the 19, the 80s sometime, I'd say, or early 90s. Uh, but it's lovely to see it and in Cavan it's very very strong in County Cavan here's a photograph from Virginia a woman called Helen Dunn sent this to me of them doing the, the bonfire the Cluedo bonfire in Cavan 64 or 65 so if you look around you'll find that a lot of things there'll be a lot of games as well played at, at those events one of the simplest games of all and you get it over in England pay, uh, play, uh, pay second over in Lancashire and places like that in England still is you roll eggs down the hill that was always a big thing the idea was you'd feast as much as you could on eggs hen eggs and duck eggs in the uh, in, on Easter Sunday or that, the, the following Monday that was the idea uh, because you weren't getting as many during Lent um, so that idea was always really interesting. The idea of the chocolate rabbit and the the, the 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 chocolate eggs, that's only a relatively new thing. If you talk to a lot of older people, it was hen eggs or duck eggs, and then the chocolate was only new. A lot of the townies might have had them, or maybe people who had a bit of money. But for a lot of people, you know, you got one Easter egg. If you didn't get one chocolate Easter egg in the 1980s, you were lucky. Now you go, which I think is a little bit shocking, really, in some ways, is that it's just there's just too much of it, you know. We'll be re, we'll be regretting it, I'd say, in year, years to years to come, the amount of uh, the, the, the amount, all that amount of sweets and chocolate. But that's neither here nor there, and I'm, I'm and I'm to blame it myself as well because I, y y y yeah, you, you don't wait least or something to eat a chocolate to eat a chocolate egg if you have them in the house. Um, but listen, come here to me. Um, just if you look there, whatever that was, the, that was the bonfire, whatever. I just want to show you one thing when we talk about Easter. Now the images we have of Easter would be this Easter bunny. Um, you look at a lot of our, a lot of our, a lot of the of our archives, a lot of our content, a lot of either for older folklore collections or from other, other collectors, and there's very little, uh, uh, very little reference to this Easter bunny. Um, and I know, and I'm not going to mention them here now, but the Easter bunny is taken on a whole new leg, and lo loads of families have Easter bunny hunts and things like that in their homes now. Uh, which is relatively new in the scheme of things as well. Very similar to the Christmas story in some ways. Uh, um, uh, mainland European, Germ uh, probably G very strong in Germany, uh, went to America and became really, really, really popular there. A lot of Germans in America had a huge influence on the traditions in America. America. And then we re-imported it. Our Christmas traditions are absolute around the Christmas tree and uh, Santa Claus are completely are Im imported in the sense they're only a couple of hundred years old. At the, at the most um, Christmas trees even less again so the Easter bunny tradition was uh, an import for in, into Ireland wasn't really, wasn't really there part of our, our Easter tradition at all um, now this, I found us on the internet tonight. night I was very funny that's how the Easter bunny became part of Easter uh, if you want to believe it you can um, but there's an interesting one whatever 
when we talk of the Easter bunny now, we talk of the Easter rabbit, right? But realistically, it was the hare. The Germans had this thing called the Easter hare. And the hare was always an interesting one because even in Irish folklore, even the month, around the month of May, the hare was always seen as a, a, a shapeshifter, a witch. Uh, some people said that the hare was... Uh, there's loads like even my own mother at home would always have the thing was if a pregnant woman met a, a hair on the road the first thing you do is you'd always have put a rip in your dress or your, that you were wearing it's because they believed that a child would be born with a hair's lip or a cleft lip is what they believed uh, so they believed that the hair was a very powerful powerful animal and it could do harm the classic story in our main folklore is and it's found all over the country I recorded accounts only contemporary accounts with travellers in Dublin a couple of years ago but you get accounts of people hearing the stories of a, a, a hare in the field on a May morning a sucking the milk from the cows and a local farmer shoots the hare and then they shoots the hare in the hip, the hare runs into a, in, into a house and they follow her into the house and when they go to the house and open the door, an old woman comes out bleeding from the hip. So this hare and this witch figure is very, very, it's very well established at this stage within our, within our, in our, in our folklore. But it's an interesting one. They said that the hare or the German hare brought goodies. He brought you little gifts. But I just couldn't help but think of this uh, 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 Befana, it's, it's, it's this Italian figure who comes, some of you might know her, but she comes on the epif or she comes on the sixth of Christmas, on Little Christmas, and she comes and gives gifts to the children. And she comes, she's a witch, and she does exactly what Santi does. And she comes, and still children in Italy would get little gifts from her, this little witch. Um, but this idea of the of the hair giving you stuff and the witch giving you stuff is an interesting one that I won't even go near to here uh, to, to use the park right now. But back to Ireland, as I said to you, uh, one of the things that people will remember, older people will remember, would be the idea of um, uh, decorating the eggs. Now, our, we didn't have Posca mar markers or crayons and things like that the way we have now and coloured. So people would remember very simple things. And I do it here with my own children as well. We'd cook outside a few eggs on Easter Sunday if we, if we can. So bits of wax, bits of uh, onions. Now, they didn't have onion, nothing like that. Bits of string, very simple things. And you just dye them up. But come here to me, half the crack is being outside. You know just the benefit of being outside, the benefit of picking a few little flowers and throwing them in and making something. The make and do, the play, the cubby house, the, all that play element is really lovely. And the idea then of sitting down. And the most important thing about eating eggs, lads, is you have a googie egg in a cup, which is, and this is a lovely Irish word. And we all, you, some of you are probably fed on this. It's a very simple thing. It's a boiled egg with a bit of butter and salt mashed up in a mug or a cup and fed to a child. If you were fancy, you put a bread, bread, bit of bread into it. Um, but that was it. But there's nothing as nice as it, right? And it's a lovely thing to do. So if you do anything on Easter Sunday or Easter over, is maybe go look at those Polish baskets, but maybe cook a few eggs outside if you can, because it would be a nice thing to do. One of the other things to do with sun, and the kind of the, 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 the Christian story is to say, all these things are layered, and I can't tease them all out in this 45 minutes with you lads, so I'll give me an overview, is the one of the things is to say, that if you get up on Easter Sunday morning, you will see the sun dancing in the sky. That's a common one found right across the world. I've seen, I came across it in the States, I find it in Newfoundland, I find it in Ireland, but it's the idea that the sun will dance, and some people will swear by it. It's an interesting one, even the, 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 the symbolism of the sun and the son of God and all those layers. You know, with, with Christianity, with the layer, layers and you mean, and stories on other pre pre, uh, pre previous symbols and what they meant but even the one of the one of the, the bits of folklore that i came across here in wexford was they said that on easter sunday it was the sun's birthday or it was the birth of the sun the sun that rose up which is an interesting one and i know that in the jewish calendar the year starts then as well and back what i was telling you before the earlier the calendar with home i uh, sorry the calendar before uh around 1752 53 was the 25th of march was the start of the new year so it's an interesting time for rebirth and the start of, of the new year which again we can't have time to go into here but there's definitely elements there, uh, elements there there but i'm going to show you one thing now i'm going to move into easter for you so all the feasting and eating as many eggs as you can that was always part of it whether you're you're eating cho chocolate ones now or eating 10 duck eggs um but that was always part of it but one of the biggest things i hear and we grew up with it at home was this is a neighbor of mine called catty Byrne, and was that you would always be dying for easter sunday to come because a mentor was going to be eggs and when a mentor was going to be eggs it was going to be one thing it was the smell of the maybush and the May bush was a big thing that we put up on the on the on the May Eve or the first of May, depending on where you are. And you would always start to collect your eggshells from Easter Sunday, because that's when you had eggs again. And you'd always collect your eggs eggshells. Now Kathy must love faking eggs because she you go up to her before Easter and she's got boxes of them. And she'll have them here like this, and she'll sit down with her markers and she'll draw a little face on them or little heads on them. Sometimes she'll string them together, almost like you know, like our Christmas tree decorations, the baubles of the Christmas tree decoration. And you would decorate your May bush, which I'll talk to you about now. Um, and there's there's Kathy's little faces. I think they're lovely. But the idea of these 
they're just gorgeous little objects the shell, shell is fantastic the idea of, it, of a shell and how strong and how hard it is and how durable it is and then to give it a, a, another go one of the lovely things and I don't have a photograph to show you and I've seen it in Offaly because the Maybush is strong in Offaly and I've seen it here in Wexford as well was that the idea was you'd always put eggshells on your Maybush but you will still see people now putting the leftover tin foil from their Easter eggs and I know one poor old woman who used to, used to honestly, God, if you went by her house, she'd swear someone had emptied a bin on top of her maybush because it was full of the um, the, the Cadbury's or whatever the brand of chocolate they wore, the boxes from the Easter eggs. So she had tinsel from Christmas, she had a silver foil, and then she had the boxes as well. So this idea of keeping Easter onto your maybush really was lovely, right? There's a great image from John Coffey. Um, John's a great photographer. And this was taken in, in, in County Leash, a lovely one of a garland of maybushes on a living white horn. Uh, in someone's yard um, and just to show you these are eggshells we do a thing here for the Wexford Maybush Festival we've been doing it we grew up doing it and Aileen her father and mother did it her father did it in particular um, and then we should be recording people and then I suppose in about 2009 or 10 I started to say yes we better do something about this and slowly every year you might work with a school you might put up a Maybush and then we said yes we better do something more serious about it because our people were kind of they, they, they loved the idea of it, right? They loved the idea, especially older women particularly loved it, passing on to their grandchildren in particular, and the men, but the women in particular. So we got a thing called the Maybush Festival. We kept it at Wexford because that's where I was born and reared, and it's the only way I could contain it. A lot of this was voluntary as well. That's completely voluntary. No, you know, the power of social media. Social media has been an amazing part in the story of the Maybush in Wexford. We have hundreds and hundreds of Maybushes back in Wexford now, hundreds, right? privately, publicly, all over the place, right? So what we did is, so, so lovely. So these are back to your eggs for you again, and people decorating their little eggs and painting them. They're gorgeous. Even it's, lo it's lovely seeing children getting them, painting them and doing whatever they want on them. Just to show you again, this is Kevin Danaher's map where the Maybush tradition was strong, very strong this part of the country. Um, you got May Bows, which is a, a different version. The Maybush here was tend, tended to be Whitehorn or Bissifors. Um, some places you get a bit of Roan or a bit of Mountain Ash. More places with a bit of uh, Sycamore and uh, depended, but particularly Whitehorn and, 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 and a forest bush was the big, the big thing here. And you get the May Flowers in the Western Counties. You get a little bit of Narclo in North Wexford here as well. But I'll show you that later on. But the thing is that here's the thing. God didn't invent everything and drop and give them to the Irish lads because some people forget this now and they all right is that these traditions are found. This is these are this is from northern Spain, um and identically look at the May tree with it covered in eggshells, covered in flowers, and I know I've seen the same in in, in parts of France as well. And so the, our, the traditions around the May stuff would be very very strong in parts of northern Spain still as well. Um, there's a the Maybush in our village here in Ballandagan, just to show you. But again, the continuation of Easter is there. That continuation of the eggs and the little ribbons and flowers are there. And again, social media, local papers, been a brilliant tool in getting the story back. Very, very simple thing. Um, I know you're doing something similar there, but just if, if, it's, if it's any use to you. One of the things which I love, you might see a bit here in this photograph here, you can see it. Um, uh, that poor woman has since passed away, is that... Um, there's a forest maybush and it looks like someone dumped a few yolks on it. You know, there's nothing. People did it privately. My mother did it privately. There's a bit of an Easter egg there as well and an Easter egg wrapper and that. That poor woman, this was taken in May, the 1st of May last year and Mary died in August, right? So that's Mary Coleman, a neighbour of mine. She's grown a little white horn and the little white horn is a powerful thing here because a couple of years ago as well, what we started to do was we started to distribute. I started me and Alien and the children. That's who it was. We started to get a couple of bits of white horns from the, from the local authority or the council and give them out to people to plant. And they were not these big fancy um, town ones. They were basically little quiet ones in housing estates, in schools, in yards, that kind of way. The idea of planting them back, literally planting them back into the communities where a family might stick it on and every maid will go up and decorate that for the month of May. And I'll show you, I'll tell you more about it later on. But it's funny, lads, you see the, see the Easter rabbits and that as well? You see that? There's loads of crossover. You'll see little little bits of crossover. They're very similar to the Easter trees that you see now. That I think that's probably a relatively new thing, whatever the Maybush is. Here's the most the most honest Maybush photograph you'll get, right? This is a man called Luke Dorn. And if you look, he's bringing the cattle across the road and he's got his May bush tied up here. He puts it up on May Eve. He normally put up on May Eve and a few primroses. And um, if you had uh, uh, if you had any other kind of yellowy flowers and maybe a little bit of string or a little bit of ribbon, tiny bits now, and you tie them on the gate where the cow was passing. Now, a lot of people know a lot of new age readings on what they, what they meant. But for the people here that I would meet from Wexford, Donegal, Tipperary, Offaly, who put up May bushes, a lot of the older people put them up to keep bad luck 
keep the fairies away, to stop the fairies milking the cows in the fields. That's what Dora Far, that's what they believe Dora Far. Um, and now they've become something else, they're a kind of decorative feature. But you know, this is lovely to come across the loop with that, right? And again, just to show you where the Maybush thing was strong, but also to say up in Sligo and up in, in Mayo and Donegal, and you will find it as well. And maybe if you go looking in Clare as well, you'll have the sprinkling of the Mayflowers. It's very, very strong. They are still, and you will get flowers put thrown at the thresholds to stop the fairies going in. Some people say the fairies are afraid of yellow for some reason. Uh, but it depends, again, there's, you know, no one makes up the rules. People do it, but it's lovely. And um, it's done. It's done in Arklow as well. Of all places in Arklow town, in Wicklow, South Wicklow, an industrial, post-industrial town, people are still sprinkling May flowers on their, on, their, on their doorstep. We also have a thing called a May Queen. And the May Queen was like, a, a again, straight in from Europe, lad, straight over from Wales and England and straight over from Germany and places like that, straight down from northern Spain. I don't know how it came in, but it came in and we'd always have a little May Queen and now May King and they would decorate the May bush, right? But there's this planting scheme, which might be of interest to you, little baby white thorns, giving them out to people. They cost 30, 40 cent and uh, people would, we dropped them around. So we've hundreds and hundreds of these grown. Uh, in the original days, we kept an eye on where we had them, but we just don't have the time and the resources to do it now. So we, it, but it, we know that it's, it's worked and we, because it works because we get photographs back like these of schools, planted theirs um, and putting them up. And we've got the schools competitions and things like that. So I'm nearly at the end, but I'm going to end with this because the Maybush is important in the Easter story, but this is the one last kind of day. One thing that people would do at home on the May Eve is you'd sprinkle the water or tran water as they call it in the fields to keep away the fairies and protect the crops and get the crops to grow. But one of the things, and as part of the Easter story was 40 days before Easter Sunday, we had to start a Lent and 40 days after is a thing called the Rogation Days. And if you go around and ask people, a lot of older people will talk about these things called the Rogation Days and they're called the Three Rogation Days. And the Rogation Sunday is the, is the oh God, a fifth Sunday, I think, after Easter Sunday. But it's the 40th, uh, sorry, it's the, the days after that. It's the Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. And it comes from the, 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 the Rogara to ask. And basically it was done right through all over mainland European, especially in the Catholic countries. And they would go out and bless the fields. It's tied in with blessing the bounds of the land. There's, there's loads of other layers to it. But the idea that you would go in and you would mark your territory, but you'd also kind of bless the crops, the growing crops, right? And um, But here's a woman called Margaret Minchin, who lives at the other side of the mountain from me up in Carlow, South Carlow. And I'm going to end with this video with you. And if Margaret, she still spreads the water and it went up and she just got her hip replaced and she went out even with her hip replaced. She went out in the mobility scooter and uh, went out and spread the uh, land, the water on the land. And I'm going to let you look, listen to Margaret here now. And that is completely tied in with Easter because you get your water on Easter Sunday or so Easter, Holy, Easter Saturday, the Saturday before Easter Sunday. And then you keep it up and you go out then and you spread it on the land. So have a listen, listen to Margaret. Margaret, you've got a bottle of holy water in your hand. Yes, which is Easter water. And what do you do with that? I spread it, what's called the Rogation Days, the Latin word, which is Rogara, which means to ask. And we ask God's blessing on the crops and on the animals for the rest of the year. A bountiful harvest, fine weather and protection for the crops. And you spread it on the fields the three days before Ascension Thursday. And do you do it? I've done it all my life, and my father and mother got resting before me, and everybody. I kept up the tradition, and I never missed it. Thanks be to God that I got the help to do it still. And you did it this year as well? Did this year still. <laughs> and hopefully next year, please God, in my life. Yeah, I couldn't miss it. Yeah. I'm going to stop Margaret there. She goes on more. But is that, I, I, I love listening to her. And Margaret's a very devout religious woman, but a lot of people would do another thing where they'd spread it on May Eve as well, to spread particular water in the fields, and sometimes we'll do it very privately. Um, and that's the that's a, that's the, uh, the, the most of my ramble here with you. Just to say, if you want to find more, uh, my, my, find out more about the May Day stuff, go to that RTE player. There's loads of stuff on uh, RTE page. Type in May Day and Michael Fortune, it'll come up. And especially that Spanish kind of stuff will come up around the, the May bush and the Easter, the eggs and stuff like that as well for me. Easter. And the last thing I'm going to tell you is uh, there's a book, I literally brought it out at Christmas and we sold out two reprints of it and completely self-published, no funders behind us. 
in the sense that the, the Wexford County Council gave a few bob towards the research part, but I had to kind of print it myself. But it's a, it's a book on the folklore of County Wexford. Um, so if you're interested in that, it's got QR codes and some of the videos and links and folklore around little traditions. So it's like almost like a very like a parish journal. I'm holding up here in my hand, 130 pages. And if you want to get copies, you can get it copies at folklore.ie. There is some Clare stuff in it. I have some lovely stuff in Clare about the, the St. Bridget's Cross traditions from North Clare and West Clare. Um, that tradition around St. Bridges Cross, so there is local stuff there. But come here, you, you, if you're if you're into that kind of stuff, you might enjoy it. It's fifteen euros. So listen, I'm gonna I'm stop talking. I'm gonna maybe answer some questions if you have any. Thanks a million, Anya, for inviting me to do this talk. It's lovely to do it. I prepared those slides just for you and, and uh, on for for this talk. And I'm I'm glad I'm glad you asked me because I'm glad I got a chance to do it. So uh, thanks for listening to me. Thank you so much, Michael. Amazing as always. I I always think like there's so much in it. Like you say, the layers. And the things maybe sometimes that we the assumptions we make or the things that we we think, as you said, are, are particular to us. And it's always good to to get that reminder that um, we're part of a much bigger story, uh, which is brilliant. Some nice comments here. Uh, amazing stories. Absolutely. And a question here from Alice. And if anybody else has questions, please pop them into the chat or the Q&A, whichever. Um, Suits or equally, if you have any traditions, I was thinking as I was going through, there's probably plenty of ideas or memories people have um, of these things themselves. It would be lovely to hear them and where you're from as well um, would be part of that. But Alice asked uh, the Easter bonnet, Michael, um, what's the story, I suppose, with the Easter bonnet? And then, yeah, maybe connected to that, that they always got new clothes as children in Tipperary for Easter Sunday. Do you have anything on the Easter bonnet? I don't. Not, not well, in the sense that I, I it was... It seemed to be the ICA kind of promoted an awful lot in Ireland. But back to the thing, the, the idea of getting new clothes for some Easter was lovely. That's a lovely thing that, that your the contributor asked to put there. The Easter bonnet, as far as I could see, was kind of a, was like the ICA, uh, kind of more well-off ladies. You know, that kind of way it was very, I, I always kind of associated with very kind of more English, more more English than Irish, you know, that kind of way. Um, And, you know, kind of like the, like the races, dressing up for the races. I haven't seen it here in the folk tradition of people uh, and you're doing it but the idea of getting nice clothes and uh, i'm going to mass maybe on sunday that's lovely that's a lovely 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 thing to hear yeah very nice and um, pat brangan there saying would love to introduce reintroduce the maybrush tradition in county mead so you're inspiring and um, as i said you know it's it and i think that is it's so important to see what people have done somewhere else and maybe to see how it might fit in the context um of various people um, and rena saying yeah thank you very much I actually have one question you, you possibly touched on, but I was finding myself trying to explain to two young children here in this house, what is the connection with Easter and eggs? And I know you were kind of saying it was, you know, obviously the finish of Lent. Is it as simple as that, that just there was kind of a lack of eggs for that time? Or is there any reason why it was eggs specifically? Um, because I, I was struggling <laughs> when I got asked the question. <laughs> Yeah, come here, and I, I, I probably won't be any better to you. I, for sure, I'd say there's the layer with the eggs. I'm thinking that's for what the, the, the going off eggs for Lent. Um, I also think there's sim the sim there's something about the, the egg in the sun or something. There's something there which I don't can't get my head around. I haven't got I haven't got the knowledge to be able to, to explain to you. Um. There's something around rebirth there or something about an egg that's really powerful there. And there's something about an egg in the sun. I can't tease it out anymore, but I'm, you know, I, I don't, you know, um, I'm probably, I'm as vague as you were on it. <laughs> There's, there's, I can't I can't help but think think she even she's cracking open an egg and they've got a lovely perfect circle like the sun inside in it. Do you know that kind of way? There's uh, there's something going on there, but well, well it's it's reassuring to know that I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't um sending them too far wrong with my vague answers. And that's good. Um there's a question there as well about the loss of these traditional practices. Did it maybe contribute to the loss of Christian faith in Ireland? I suppose that that could be um, either way. That Yeah. But and, any thoughts on that, I suppose? And yeah, Alice there saying fertility and the egg, which is probably part of the, the yeah, story, too. Absolutely. Yeah. And the start of New Year with the Jewish start of New Year on the 25th. Absolutely, Alice. I, I, I think it's there for sure. So the lot to answer the other question. So the loss of these traditional practices may have contributed to the loss of Christian faith in Ireland. I don't know. I know we 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 didn't know we didn't know the case here is that the, the church actually went against the Maybushes in Wexford. There was a famous priest and he won't give his surname, but he was known as Father Skiok. Skiok, by the way, is a name for a white horn. 
and they didn't like the Maybushes because they were, they were, they were always dance settlements. So when you have dancers, you have boys and girls and whatever else, hum, human nature kicks in and they, they couldn't control it. And to hear the, 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 the Maybush dances were kind of almost put, 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 put like, like the, the, the house dances, and the, you know, like the dance hall acts in Ireland, they were kind of pushed, pushed into the private homes. So the church had a negative impact on that in some ways, uh, of the public Maybush dances for sure. Um, uh, with regard to what I suppose with, with other stuff come let me see yeah you can see it with the May bush is an interesting one you have the May altar and then you'll have the May bush you know that kind of way sometimes what you do is you get layers of boat you, I'd often come across a couple of May bushes here now and you'll have the Virgin Mary stuck in the bottom or sometimes you'll have the Virgin Mary sellotaped up to the top right so you know those, 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 all, those little, all those layers I hope that answers your question uh, the loss of the traditional practices I don't know why we lost I did the nose dive back in the 60s early 70s I don't know. I think we saw. Like I used to ask the granny at home, "Jeez, did you, did you, uh, did you do that?" No. Oh, I, I, why would you want to know that? She said to me, and I'd go, uh, "Man told me an awfully there today about days to do something." And then she, oh, I, I, I read that. And she tell you, why didn't you tell me? She, why would you want to know that? So they didn't see any value in it. They suppose I saw them as being backward. They were wanting to move on. You know, the past. I keep saying the past to them wasn't romantic. It was full of hardship, hardship and hunger. She said, "You know, that's what that's what the past was for them." Um, we can look back now, you know, with different kind of different different perspective on things. Um, but so yeah, but it's an interesting. One. I, I do see definitely. I notice with the old Maybush thing, it's an interesting one that that people are kind of owning it again a little bit. They're kind of going, "Geez, we better move, uh, use it or lose it." You know, that kind of way a little bit. Um, and again, a lot of the grandparents and a lot of the grandmothers uh, are really a powerful part in that conversation. Yeah, very interesting. Um, yeah, which came first, chicken and egg, and all these things is is. Yeah. Anyway, um, if we've, I don't know if we've any more questions. People seem to be, um, I think slowing down on the questions, so we might leave it at that for this evening. Um, and then to say, as uh, Rihanna did, that I hope everybody has a lovely Easter, and eggs of of many varieties. And thanks uh, again to Michael. And I would really recommend people have a look, like I said, at your various uh, social media channels and folklore.ie and. To, to get the book as well because I've I've had some I've had your um calendar in the past a wonderful publication so I can only imagine the book is the same and thank you so much Michael yeah, good night so. everybody good night everyone bye now